Welcome everybody to the third iteration of the masterclasses. Uh, I am Lita, one of the analysts here at the Cape Town office, and we are very happy, uh, those of you that are still with us on this journey, and we are quite excited today for today's session. And so we we'll hope you're looking forward to it, and hopefully there'll be some discussion here that you folks can sink your teeth into and really get you thinking around the planning and goals segment of your innovation strategy. So we are on the third leg today, and we have some lovely guests that I'll also introduce later, and just a great guiding question that I shall also get into a little bit later. But just what I wanted to do is reiterate some of the housekeeping and admin. There's a Q&A that I thoroughly encourage you to put your questions in as any thoughts are catalyzed and any thinking is sparked. There is a chat section for any comments that you'd like to, you know, let the panelists know about or anything that you are thinking of. And we're here to engage you. We're here to, as we did in previous sessions, get your thoughts on this whole process and maybe ask the questions to the panelists that maybe weren't answered in some of the questions that I had put together for them. Another point that I sort of want to get across is, again, everything that you see today, we shall condense it in a mailer and send it off to you later on this week. And so please don't fret if you don't get to digest a slide properly, it will be in your mailbox by the end of this week. So moving on, just a reminder about our, our flagship report, the Way to Play 2021 Plus report. If you haven't read it, highly recommend you read it. It takes all the insights that we're speaking about in these uh, five weeks and really adds texture and layer to how Itonics works methodologically, but also in terms of the key trends as well as some emerging technologies that we think are very, very, very key to the future um, and, and how innovation works. So please, uh, I, I can't recommend that report enough. And the, the link is in previous mails, but it will be in an additional mail this week as well. So just to recap quickly what had occurred last session, last session was pictures of the future. And we had spoken about the idea of pictures of the future and developing resiliency we spoke about key drivers of trends and emerging technologies to understand future scenarios. We spoke about the different horizons that exist in, in the scenario planning process. And then we spoke about the idea of using a steep analysis framework alongside trends and emerging technologies to discover future opportunity spaces. So that was kind of the discussion last week. And you know some of these slides should be familiar to you. They were in the mail as well as um, presented by Michelle Beale who was one of our uh, panelists last week. So today, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build upon what we had spoken about last week in terms of planning for the future, in terms of understanding the different horizons and uh, sort of thinking critically of what are the short-term goals and how exactly do these link up to more long-term goals and the scenario approach. And so we are excited today to take it a bit step further and talk about planning and goals. And in essence, our thesis statement for today is how do we identify actions and goals based on opportunity spaces? But deeper than that, how do we galvanize stakeholders in the organization that we're in to be part of the process of this planning and goals and this innovation process? How do we keep them in the loop? How do we make sure that everybody's singing from the same hymn book, so to speak? And then how do we, how do we align our organizational and um, innovation activities with the greater strategic objectives. And so that's kind of going to be the aim for this, for this discussion with you know, the, the human-centered approach to strategic planning and implementation, as well as having that discussion around how does road mapping play a role in the innovation journey and in allowing one to you know, expertly and efficiently execute the innovation objective. So that's more or less what we're speaking about today. But with no further ado, I want to introduce our guests and our panelists, because I'm really excited for the, for the two people that we have discussing today, even though one of them is a familiar face. Um, I'll start off with Christopher Robertson, who is our strategy business development at Itonics. And so I'll let him speak for himself and introduce himself and the wonderful work that he does at Itonics. Chris, over to you. Hi, thanks. Hi, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Robertson. I'm responsible here for strategy business development in Itonics. I take rather more of an internal corporate view on helping this business succeed and making sure that we're understanding and working with our clients and customers. But today I'll be drawing more on my experience from uh, my role as director 
of innovation management in Adidas um, that's sitting um, across Germany and the US, so a global role, looking at the product portfolio, but also the governance of how we actually bring some of these ideas to life. So I'll be drawing on that today. Thank you so much, Christopher. Really happy that you're here with us. Rachel, uh, Ramsey is a familiar face to those of us who've been walking this journey of these masterclasses, but just in case there's a new face or there's a new name in the, in the, in the attendees, Rachel, do you wanna just give them a quick uh, overview of who you are and what is it you do? Thanks, Dieter. Um, yes, it's great to be back again, and I'm really looking forward to the next conversation. For those that haven't heard yet, I'm Rachel, and I work as the Innovation Manager at Smolin, and so part of the Innovation Department. And just a, a little bit of background, Smolin um, is a global commerce solutions company. Our headquarters are based here in South Africa, and really we work to connect people, brands, and opportunities. Our core service offering is um, field team retail merchandising. Our clients include the like of Unilever, PepsiCo, Heineken. We are a, um, traditionally a B2B business that's been around for nearly 90 years now. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can just have a, a conversation amongst the three of us. And I'm gonna start with you, Chris. Um, so, I mean, your role at Adidas, but also I think there's also overlap with your role here at Itonix, you've sort of had to communicate innovation objectives across different stakeholders and departments and almost orchestrating members from different functions to, to, to have the same idea and have and sing from the same proverbial hymn book. So please, you have the floor, just chat us through your, your, your experiences of doing this, but also what your, your best practice would be for effectively communicating strategic goals. Wow, yeah, um, I think if we put ourselves in the innovation position, so we are approaching existing business. Smolin has a number of years operating. But if you're starting to look at um, an organization and challenge not only what they're doing, but how they're doing it, um, you have to come with the right level of um, pitch. So that means you have to start gaining trust of those around you um, and find common ground with them. So there's no use in me talking about apples when everybody else is talking about oranges. You need to find this, this middle way. So I feel that having a clear um, strategy outlook just helps you align around the purpose and goals. So do we all agree this is what we're here to do? Do we all agree that this is the direction we're heading in? And do we all agree that this is perhaps the best way um, to get there? What it also helps with is simply having um, your team in a mode where they're anticipating the next step. Um, so you move from being reactive, that's happened, so now I have to make this, rather to a more proactive stage. So, okay, we, we've seen the outlook, we understand what it takes, I can now feel a little more comfortable and I can start to put my trust into the process um, to move ahead. Everybody also likes to feel included, right? So. Um, it also feels good to be part of something, your voice to be heard. So if something is put down on paper or communicated, it gives you an opportunity to say, I don't understand it. It's not clear to me. I need some further direction. We used to talk about putting something down that people would hate because at least it would start a conversation and it gives you a base to begin from. So team members start to feel included, informed and heard. And I think that's really important when it comes to the execution phase, you start to move into action because there's no room for what I would call convenient confusion. Um, I didn't hear, I wasn't on the list, so on and so forth. It just means that we can really come back and objectively say, um, we're doing this because of this strategy. It, it takes away the subjectivity, it takes away some of the emotion and allows things to move. And you can use this sort of third party, the strategy, and is the lever to do so. What I also like from a, a governance perspective is the fact then that it starts to set the rhythm um, of the conversation and defines the expectations and the boundaries as well. So in one sort of swoop, having this uh, clear communication, you're building trust and you're setting clear direction and it starts to give the business this feeling of moving forward, a bit of momentum. Um, especially when it's something that's quite new or a little more radical, it's nice to have those first footholds to help you move forward. I wanna ask you a question when you and I had spoken individually around 
the idea of malleability and you'd use a very fantastic um, you know stand-up comedy analogy around presenting to people and how exactly you need to have almost like a think on your feet mentality but also be aware of the audience that you're speaking to could you elaborate a little bit more on that and how you've communicated a specific um strategic vision and how you adapt that to the different audiences within an organization if you may yeah um so this is probably quite a lengthy analogy so hang in there um but i think innovation is often so far out there and the people that live innovation are very comfortable in that landscape, in that world. Um, so you will talk amongst your peers, you talk amongst your team, you are fluent in the language, uh, you know the dialects, and you've been to all the countries that innovation is being, being operated in. The challenge is, is when you open the door and step out into your organization, into your personal life, um, it becomes harder to articulate. Um, the People don't have those same connection points. So what's important is that you start to lay down common ground. Um, and this is what brings me to stand-up comedy. If you went to see a stand-up comic um, and they started to talk about innovation methodology, um, I'm sure there's some good jokes in there, but you'd have to work really hard to, to get them. But this idea of going into, an, going into an audience where you actually haven't really earned the right to, to tell them what you think yet, um, you have to really work. You have to bring them on a journey you have to um, find these little hotspots where you can say, okay, if this is comfortable, let me bring you into this area. Let me take you down this path and we'll go a little further and we'll explore this area. And I think the comedy topic is also very important because what you see on the stage is often years of work or at least months of work of reviewing, refining, ideating, changing, pivoting, sharpening, readjusting, reordering, and all you're seeing is the finished, polished uh, product at the end. But the person who's telling you this story has thought about the order of the words, uh, the choice of the words, and very, very thought through and very labored to make sure that it lands with this audience of people that actually they don't know and have no connection to. So I think this is really important that we understand, are we going, what's the audience that we're meeting? What are their expectations? How do I make sure that um, I can acknowledge those expectations, but bring them into the world that I want to articulate um, and also leave them with the feeling that they're not being lectured to, but rather that they're being um, heard, understood, and that we have this common uh, rapport and that helps us sort of build trust together. Because in a, in a comedy room or in a, in a, in a stand-up show, if the trust isn't there, nothing's going to work. Uh, both parties will feel incredibly uncomfortable and it's, it will simply not flow. So it's about how do I help this audience see uh, what I'm doing? How do I get them to feel what I'm about? And how do we start to build that mutual trust together? I think that comes with this, um, this aligned purpose and understanding and clarity around the goals and the direction. Superb, thanks so much, Chris. Rachel, I'll pivot to you for a second. Um, Chris mentioned alignment, and I'm curious from your perspective within your space, how did you go about that process of aligning your environmental scanning activities, your scenario planning, and the opportunity spaces that were identified there with the larger strategic direction of smaller? Thanks, Lita. Um, it's so great to be a part of this discussion. Um, for those of you that have been asked on this, with us sorry, on this journey over the last three weeks, you'll know that as the innovation department at Smolin, we undertook our strategy development by looking to trends and then future scenarios before creating opportunity spaces, um, like Peter just mentioned, in response to possible future potential. And so during this creative process, our thinking diverged and we created a portfolio of different opportunity spaces. And then we undertook a rating exercise with our executive team we converged um, and the opportunity spaces were rated on things like strategic fit, current capabilities, market opportunity, ease of implementation. Um, and so while both divergent and convergent, we also speak about the process being driven from both the bottom up and top down um, mm -hmm. direction. So we worked with employees from across the business to create the strategy, to create those opportunity spaces. And then we worked with our executive team to rate and align the strategy. So both of these opportunities, I really see them speaking to what Chris has just said as being activities to help ensure we are building a relevant innovation strategy or pipeline 
while also increasing the visibility of our strategy across the business and helping to generate buy-in. We really strongly believe that people support that which they create, being fundamental to what we do. And then it's time to move from strategy to activity. So the strategic themes will um, inform our projects. And as an innovation department, our opportunity spaces direct projects we choose to explore. And so first we plot, place each project along the innovation process. Um, we found that it's really important to establish the scope of the project. Do we have a solution that we need to validate or are we exploring an opportunity that could result in multiple potential products? Um, do we understand the potential market? Have we validated the market need? Do we understand the opportunity cost? There's a lot and every opportunity, I mean, sorry, project really starts with research. Um, and so I'm just gonna throw in one more pairing for you today, for both divergent, convergent, bottom up, top down. And now we're also turning, talking internal and external when it comes to research. And we have to understand, yes, the market potential and the demand, but we also really importantly have to understand Smolens, our company's current experience, knowledge, expertise, and skills um, within the scope of the project. And this is really vitally important as we move forward that we are building on our existing know-how and leveraging our internal capabilities rather than building from scratch and, and sticking something on top of. Um, and so ultimately, I think it's this collaborative nature of the process and those different pairings that have really helped to ensure we have strategic alignment and also on top of that buy-in at the same time. Yeah, and I would emphasize there that uh, clarity just simply leads to action, right? So it's nice to have uh, kind of direction being set, but every individual who wants to contribute needs to understand, so what's my role in this, right? So what am I going to do tomorrow differently than what I did today to, to, to move it in this direction? And how do I know if I'm on the path to being successful? So is there some sort of metric of success or how do we know that we're, we're making progress? And then I think most importantly, how do we get the feedback? What does that feedback look like? look like but uh yeah i would definitely agree that this uh, this just helps us move into this action and execution phase so then um i am just looking at some of the some of the chats here and folks i'm encouraging you to, to please ask questions uh to to chris and, and rachel they bring in some fascinating insights but i i do want to ask rachel just to stick with you for a second what hurdles did you encounter in this process was there any pushback any specific stakeholders that were maybe a little bit intransigent in what you were suggesting in your in your in your sort of innovation uh, pitch or how did it, how was it received? Yeah, so I think um, definitely as we stepped into the space of action, one of the biggest hurdles um, that we've stumbled across is duplication of efforts or work across the business. Um, and these silos, they can be um, departmental, regional, between different client teams. Um, and the duplication can play out in, in quite a few different ways or different dimensions in this way. Um, and so we found as we step forward into a strategy, different departments or business units or regions may already be working on an initiative or project that's quite similar. They've spotted the market need themselves or the opportunity and they got stuck in, but they haven't told others about it necessarily or haven't been verbal about their, um, their project. Um, and so that starts to create a bit of conflict um, or tension in terms of um, two things being approached from a different perspective, the same thing being approached from a different perspective. Sometimes we start to conduct internal research and we're, we start to be told, no, that it's already been done or it's already happening. Um, but we've also learned the hard way that that is often open to interpretation. So now, like Chris spoke about in terms of roles being clarified, when we start to do a little digging or a little questioning, we find out what's going on and maybe the scope of the project is different. Um, who's leading it, how much time they have available um, on their hands, um, yeah, what, what kind of expectations do they have set out? And at Smolin, we will frequently hear the term shoulder time being used. And so many projects are on the go, um, but employees are expected to find time to complete them while going about their day-to-day -day responsibilities and, as well. And so in this way, we often find that projects are not prioritized. Um, so they may be happening, but they start to fall by the wayside and not being given um, those times or resources that they actually require. And then finally, it's not just projects that are on the go, but what we've learned is that it's also important to learn from projects that have been. The other day, someone um, referred to a graveyard of ideas at Smolin, which is a slightly grim outlook. Um, but one that I think 
also hides the immense knowledge or wealth of knowledge that these failed attempts um, can hold. And so we really have to take the time to find out exactly um, why those projects perhaps died. So were they sidelined on short time um, or did the project teams actually learn that the opportunity cost was too high, the market need was not great enough. And so we really want to harness those efforts um, that knowledge that has come before. So all this to say, yeah, we've had to learn to work really hard to uncover both what we know, we know, we know we don't know, but also what we don't know, we don't know within the organization being so large. Um, and all of this to avoid duplication, make sure we are learning from our collective efforts and pulling from all our years of expertise. Excellent, that makes perfect sense. Chris, I don't know if you want to speak to that before I ask you a follow-up question that I that I'd had. Yeah, I think um, there's no playbook for certainly new product innovation directly, right? You have to always work on analogous examples or situations. So to me, innovation relies really heavily on wisdom and experience, and you could maybe bracket that under intuition as well. Um, so it's of critical importance that you look back and do some sort of lessons learned review, um, especially, you know, you might wrongly tag some of those failures and um, it might have just simply been the wrong time it was everything else was right in the right place but the timing wasn't quite there so it's important not to allow um, corporate myths and um, surrounding some of those bigger project failures to sort of cripple you going going ahead mm, good point and so i wanted to ask you chris in your current role or even in your previous role at adidas how have you practically if you have at all used scenario-based strategizing in the planning and goals process i asked this question because it's almost like a plug for our cofum uh, methodology here at itonics that there's a section specifically around scenario based strategizing and so i'm curious whether you've encountered this and what sort of merits or maybe even potential pitfalls you encountered with this yeah we've had different exercises i think most actively in the space of um, technology innovation so let's say one step prior to what a product would be or what a concept would be and on the consumer's feet. So that often involves sort of behind the scenes innovation. How can you generate um, new ingredients or, or unique ingredients? How can you generate um, kind of optimization behind the scenes, harnessing new technology, um, harnessing, uh, harnessing new research? So in terms of just putting down some, let's say if strategy is simply a series of deliberate decisions then you start up front by saying, where are we prepared to be on the offensive? Where are we prepared to be on the defensive mode? And what are we really just parking for now? So you already take um, a lot of distraction off the table. And then from there, it's again, trying to move through with some guiding principles, behaviors and priorities to say, this is what we stand for. This is why we're doing this. And here is what we want to achieve. And that ultimately allows you to be in a position to simply make decisions and uh, Rachel, as you said, to, to allocate resources, because when it comes down to it, those have to be available. And um, if there's no resources available um, inside or outside the organization, then you're going to struggle to execute anything. So this sort of um, practical, um, let's say, um, systematic approach to me is important when you're dealing with something that is incredibly unknown and incredibly volatile, that you have this balance of sort of chaos and creativity working together. But I think it just plays through then in the example of maybe, let's call it strategy execution, where you really rely on the, the vision, mission, purpose of the organization or your team um, as a foundation stone. And that, that allows you then to put some planning behind, have good discussions about how we're going to act, how do we make it happen, and then just make sure that you keep systematically working through the tracking and the review phase so as new knowledge comes in, as things change, as things move quicker than others, you can go right back in um, and start to kind of reappraise and reorientate a little your, your overall, overall planning. So this, the control objective, objectives for innovation management, I think, are your kind of crutch and your, your stepping stones towards really bringing this, um, your portfolio to life. Excellent. Thank you. Rachel, I don't know if you want to comment uh, on that, but I do have uh, a final question for you, if, if you have nothing to say to Chris on that. Um, no, I totally agree with um, what Chris is saying. And I think it's so important with the continuous tracking and like, allocation of resources to have those, those guidelines in place. Um, we really 
trying as an innovation department to, to create a framework for that creativity, the new exploration, new thinking, but we do have to create the correct selection um, and, and make those choices correctly as we move forward. And so to have those guiding, guiding principles in place really does help you decide what to remove um, as you move forward and which, which ideas to go after. Yeah. So, I mean, Rachel, since this is the last time we'll have you for the master classes, uh, I thought I'd sneak in a little bit of a, a, a theme <laughs> from our next session, which is around commitment, the commitment I, I piece around foresight and strategy. And so this is my question to you, sort of like as a parting shot, is how, how did you go about convincing leadership to commit to these innovation objectives? Um, not just theoretically, but also to, like, to act upon them. Are there any kind of like life hacks that you sort of learned that really help get them on board and keep them on board or, or anything along that line? Hmm. So I think it's all a learning process along the way. We have involved them um, obviously in um, setting that direction and those guidelines, but then we ask, or rather we demonstrate the potential of our innovation objectives and ask for that buy-in. And so along our innovation pipeline, um, it is our global expo that really acts as that, that stage gate or phase gate. And when we as the innovation department uncover an opportunity or a new potential product, we start with the research, as I said, and we unpack the opportunity, we seek to understand the potential it presents, um, and then we have to build a business case. And if we believe in that business case, we will choose to present the proposal to our global expo to actively seek buy-in in the form of budget, resource capacity, and time, those things that we ultimately need to move forward. And while some projects are quite specific in their intent, we have found um, that other opportunities presented the possibility for different teams and regions and presented at the expo to collaborate, so to combine multiple budgets, inputs, and existing knowledge and skills. So it has been, it's been really exciting on certain projects to see how our process is introducing visibility across the business from the top down. Um, in this way, rather than duplicating efforts on the ground, we're combining efforts um, through that greater transparency and open communication soonest in the process. Um, what's also been great is the opportunities have often in this way been validated through by showing interest from, from multiple departments or clients it also affords us as the innovation department the confidence to act and move forward. So we can see that something really connects with multiple members of, of our EPSCO. Um, we then feel more confident to move forward and obviously equipped to move forward with um, budget and resources at the same time. Chris, anything you want to add to that before I, I ask you your final question, before we go into Q&A, if there are any questions? I think it comes again back to this uh, building your trust bubble or the length of leash you're being given uh, how far you can push uh, to me it is again I mean there's definitely some hacks you know you can you can think of an idea but don't write it from your organization's perspective uh, kind of mock it up to look like somebody else um, and that that somehow already gets over a hurdle if it doesn't feel like our thing but actually somebody else is doing it that's in our uh, industry circle, then it becomes feasible. I think that's really interesting, just this mindset adjustment, um, a little bit of trickery can get you. Um, on the other side, I think it's really about just evidence. Um, can we link this back to clear statements? Can we link this back to clear signals? Um, how can we show that something is gathering momentum, that it's increasing in velocity, that we can really show that it's going somewhere and that we're able to match this whatever this uh, signal is with something that is, let's call it unique to us. So what are we uniquely positioned um, to give the world and what's the benefit going to be for both parties? I think if you can start to build that um, and let people experience it um, and not only experience it, but show that there's some sort of um, viability to it, that it's not just the one thing they have to wait 10 years for, it's, something that can perhaps ramp over time. It's got a life cycle behind it. It can live and breathe. It can diversify. I think it's important to show that um, you've thought it through and that helps um, to build the commitment because you're again building this trust between both parties that you can, you're understanding their needs. You can't wait 10 years for something, but rather um, you're showing that there's a path um, to the solution and that path is step-by-step -step feasible and doable. Okay, superb. I think linking to that, then my final question for you is like, 
you have spoken, Chris, about top to bottom awareness, the room to have conversation, mm -hmm. engaging, you know, all stakeholders in the mission, vision, and the purpose. You know, transparency, consistency, etc. With that in mind, what do you see as the role of an innovation uh, platform in sort of housing uh, strategic goals as well as like the planning process? Mm -hmm. I, I'm I, I'm curious to get your philosophy around that since. You know, it's part of the thing that we do at Itonics. Uh, one thing is this one version of the truth. Um, pilot projects often just simply get named and renamed and changed. So what is this thing that we're talking about uh, and who's doing it and why and what are the key themes and objectives? And a little bit to the small an example, um, how do I have, how do I understand what's going on if I can't even keep track of the simple things? So. And let's get the basics right. Let's get the foundations right. That's number one. Um, number two is also um, this ability to see, um, let's say, the kind of spectrum of what's what's there. Um, so where are the hotspots and maybe where are the gaps? So you start to be able to piece those um, elements together. So I think it's really about just simply having... Um, yeah, the ability to reduce the friction, right? So it's the friction of the emails asking you questions, it's the friction of the phone calls, it's those quick presentations that turn into three hours of prep and a 15 minute delivery, where if you have this element of transparency, you're giving, you're handing the control over to others to passively observe and feel like they're part of something without taking away your time. So your time is then better spent adding value and not just maintaining this administrative level. And I think that's critically important as we move ahead. So we talk about a kind of friction factor. So every time you get a new project, every time you have to handle another stakeholder group, that friction factor increases pretty dramatically. Um, and we think we can manage it if the foundations and the simple things are being handled um, in the best way. So that's my, that's what I hope to alleviate is some of this kind of additional friction that sits on top. Um, that makes perfect sense. Rachel, any thoughts on that? Um, no, I think, Sorry, Chris has done an excellent job. Um, and it really speaks to those different parts I mentioned earlier about that duplication of, um, of work. And I think not only duplication in the actual project, projects themselves, but in the innovation team's um, time as well, time and resources as a small department. I think that's really excellent to highlight that as well, um, that it, it can save you on both fronts. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I'm looking out for any questions or any comments that people have in the chat for our you know, esteemed panelists. But as, as we await uh, for people to maybe ask questions or make uh, any commentary, I do wanna sort of speak around this idea of road mapping and you know, how road mapping plays into the discussions that we're having, because I think we there's, there's been a clear outline from our experts around the idea of having humans in the, in the innovation management process you know Rachel and Chris have spoken about transparency consistency and having that communication with stakeholders as the, as the linchpin of a successful strategic planning process but I think road mapping does have a, a an interesting part to play within this because it, it helps you know visualize and contextualize the, the innovation implementation as a way to sort of translate strategy into operation. And so, you know, at, here at Itonics, we, we, we have this kind of structure of a roadmap and why it, it, it plays an important role within the strategy execution. And, you know, if you're looking at the, the slide that I'm sharing at the moment, there's almost like the Y axis and the X axis. And so on the X axis, you have these sort of questions that are asking about the status quo and a vision of like, where are we currently? How can we move forward? Where do we want to go? And then, on the y-axis, there's almost like the action-centered questions. You know, why do we need to do this? What is it that we need to do, and how exactly can we go about achieving it? And there's there's a modular structure to this that's been sort of used at, at, at Itonics by by our by, by our analysts and our consultants, and we've used it with clients to 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 a to great success. And so I think the the, the process of road mapping within this within this conversation is quite a it's quite a key piece. Um, not just as a, as a way to visualize what it is that you're trying to outlay, but to think about what are the different elements that are needed for the process? What are the different resources within the organization? What is the horizon level? When exactly you're trying to, uh, you know, 
unpack this whole process and when what are the different milestones that you're looking at how exactly do you garner and, and galvanize commitment from people and what are the types of what are the types of roadmaps and, and, and innovations that you're trying to um, you know take into consideration is it product centered is it technology is it a mixture of both these are think conversations that when you know outlining a strategic process and and, and trying to create a, a an innovation objective is to think through and so I think just taking on the insights that Chris and Rach have have, have, have put across is thinking around what exactly are you are you are you working towards? What are the what are what are the what are the different elements that you're thinking of? Because you have the demand drivers, which speak to you know consumer expectations, consumer needs, and what you're seeing happening in the market. But then on the other hand, you have the you know solution drivers, which might be a technology roadmap where you might be galvanizing internally for initiatives to take place where you in, you sort of leverage emerging technologies to meet these demand drivers or improve existing business models and help realize strategic goals. And so these can sort of work together where you create internal capabilities to meet an actual phenomenon that you're seeing within the marketplace. And so I think it's important to say within this conversation that at Itonics we have our road mapping tool that we think um, as, as Chris had mentioned, you know, it's not having multiple stories as one place to have the story of what exactly the process is going to be. And it's that single point of truth to help organizations plot the environmental scanning alongside their scenario planning. And so, yeah, we, we sort of back this because we've seen it work with clients, but also it's, it's a much more dynamic alternative to the static Excel or PowerPoint um, document that might just sit in someone's drive or sit on a, hard, on a, on a cloud without people really engaging it. And so the, our, the, the roadmap tool that we have allows you to you know, take emerging technologies and trends and correlate these with your own objectives and host these across a timeline on something that's more collaborative and, and interactive and, and quite aesthetically pleasing as well. And so, yeah, I think it's something that, that, that whether it's, it's a product roadmap or a technology roadmap or maybe a hybrid of both, the, the Itonics roadmap does offer this holistic forecast um, that can help you understand a technology's market impact over time, as well as aligning this maybe to 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 market demands. All of course with the with the with the purpose of empowering you to execute your strategy. And so, I think that is more or less the last piece that that I had you know planned to discuss. I don't know, Chris and Rachel, if there's anything else that you folks want to say uh, before we close up. If there aren't any questions. Oh, sorry, I just see a question now from Sylvian Barron, excuse me. And he asks, what is the process to go from innovation ideas to minimum viable product to new product roadmaps? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one on. I think every organization is going to have a different approach. Um, if I were looking at this, I, if it's really this first sort of iteration and innovation idea, I'd ask for a bit of a proposition, so what's the hypothesis? Um, how are we going to ensure relevancy? So how, who am I asking? Uh, and what's the question that I'm asking to gauge relevance? And then secondly, how am I going to ensure that there's a certain level of differentiation um, to what others are doing? And because it could quick, if it's, if it's different but not relevant, then we're going to struggle. If it's relevant but not different, we're going to struggle some more. But if we hit that sweet spot, where we can um, address a need, but stand quite sort of individual or unique in the market, then we're probably on a good path. So then the second part of that would then be developing sort of a, a quick set of experiments. So uh, what's, the first, what's the first critical test? What's the first critical thing we need to know? Um, who are we testing it with? What's the fail criteria? So do we have a threshold or benchmark? And then what time period do you need and what resources to get to that point? So, if that, all, if that package sounds good, happy to let it run. And when that group comes back and starts to present and gives the outlook, I am certainly thinking of kind of four main blocks. I'm thinking about um, the desirability, uh, two sides, desirability for me as an organization, desirability for the, for the end consumer. Um, I'm thinking about the feasibility. Um, is it even possible to do it once, um, twice? And then the viability, which is, is it possible to do this on a longer term? Um, how many of these kind of innovation S curves can I get out of it? Um, and what is the room for growth and differentiation um, within that? And then the third or the fourth and final bucket is actually thinking about 
um, the sustainability um, impact. So what is it that I'm doing? Um, how, how scalable is it? What's the impact on the first, second and third order and beyond um, in terms of its approach? And if that package starts to come together, then we can move into a really healthy um, discussion around um, return on investment, business case, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because my personal feeling is putting too much pressure on an innovation idea, like you called out at the earliest point, starts to make it feel a little heavy. Um, so if we have a team in place that is the permission to explore and to come with this robust um, overview, then I'm already happy. And then the next critical question would be to my peers um, within an operations group or sales group or whomever, if you look at this idea and we have the MVP in front of you, what questions do we have to answer to make you confident to buy in and go ahead? So rather than saying, tell me what you don't like, it's rather asking, what do we have to do to make you trust in this um, for you to put your energy behind it at a later point? And if you tick those boxes, my gut feeling is um, that you have a healthy chance of getting something on a new product roadmap. Totally aligned with what Chris has suggested there. Um, both that saying how we, and I think that aligns to what we do um, at Small End in terms of building out that initial business case to take forward to the business um, for further buy in and, and, and development at that stage. And so it's so important to understand those four criteria that he put forward first to grow out that business case as you move forward. Great. Um, I'm looking at the time and it's actually quite incredible how quickly 45 minutes has gone by. Uh, yeah, I just want to pay homage to our uh, panelists, Chris, Rachel, thank you so much, Rachel, in particular for the three weeks that you've been here. Uh, folks, I just want to close a couple of housekeeping notes. Next week, we're discussing commitment and the role that commitment plays within the innovation uh, process. We're trying to get our, actually not trying, we've gotten um, uh, Dr. Michael Durst to be our, 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 our keynote speaker. And he's gonna be talking about how do I get management buy-in and commitment for innovation goals. And that same time, this time next week, and we are gonna send you all these slides in a mailer with some additional um, context for them, as well as a link to the Where to Play 2021 Plus report. And for those that are also trying to get their heads around what we've discussed this week and uh, also last week, there's a fantastic blog around scenario planning and pictures of the future that Michelle Beale wrote. It was published on Friday, so please check that out. We'll also try to get a link for that as well. But yeah, Chris, Rachel, really appreciate your time and your insights. And it's been a, it's been a fantastic discussion. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Thanks. I think you're all lucky it's uh, restricted to 45 minutes. I could talk a lot longer. <laughs> I don't say that. Don't say that. We would have loved to have you talk long. Okay, cool. Cheers, folks. See you next week. Cheers. Thank Bye. you.